Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome to our course. In this lecture we're doing a project preview of the Unreal project that we're building in this course. So first we're going to learn how to build a procedural level with procedural generation. So each time we hit play on this game the level will actually look slightly different because we're using procedural generation. We're going to build out different tiles and these tiles will be placed in different positions and at different rotations in order to create this unique level look for every single time you hit play. The more tiles you have the more unique the game will look. Then we are going to learn how we can enable a blueprint to build a segmented version of the level. So every time we hit E, we can have this segmented view. Okay, so that way we can generate data sets really quickly with Unreal because we can write a blueprint that is going to be able to run around the game and rotate objects or rotate the character and take a screenshot of the game in realistic view and then in segmented view. So your machine learning model will then have the X which is the image in realistic view, and then the Y, which is the image segmented. And that way, a machine learning model can learn how to segment objects and images. In other words, how to outline objects or find where each different object is inside of an image. All right, so with the power of Unreal, it really enables your ability to build huge data sets, especially perfect for neural networks and deep learning because those perform better with huge data sets. And instead of having to go out into the real world to take photographs or collect images or use someone else's open source data sets, you can actually create your own realistic images from a thousand different angles and positions, all thanks to Unreal and also procedural generation. Because each time we press play here, the level is going to look slightly different. And so we have a whole new world where we can gather data. And that is going to be the project. Very fun project and straightforward. So I'm excited to show you how this works once you learn how to build out this type of project with blueprints. You can really expand your machine learning ability because your ability to create realistic images for your machine learning projects is just going to explode. So it's a very fun and useful project for any machine learning beginner or expert who wants to build out their own data sets that are realistic, as well as any Unreal or game developer fan who wants to learn how to use Unreal and a game engine for machine learning. So it's great to add to your toolkit and your career portfolio. So join me coming up, we are going to begin our project. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we set up our Unreal project, and in this section, we're now going to begin building random levels automatically with procedural generation. The first step of that is to create a procedural level tile, because each random level is going to be created with these tiles. For example, you can have four different tiles, and then if you duplicate those tiles, and you put them in random positions and you rotate them randomly, then you'll create your random level. This is just one way of creating a procedural level. All right, so let's open up our project once again. And here I've just increased my computer text size so it's a bit easier for you to read. And I've opened up my levels window here, which you can access with window levels. This persistent level refers to the third person template map. So we want to actually create a new persistent level. This will be the parent for our tiles. So you could create levels right here, create new, but that would create a child of the persistent level. If you want to actually create a new persistent level itself, you go to file and here you're going to select new level. Then select empty level as your type. 
look at this. Your viewport becomes now black because the level has changed. The level is no longer that third person template. And we now have as well our persistent level. If you hit control S, you can save this procedural level. All right, so I'm going to go into content. Then I'm going to create a new subfolder inside of my content folder. I'm going to call this my levels folder. All right, and here we can then go into procedural levels or levels, whatever folder you want to have. And I'm going to call this my persistent level and hit enter. Okay, that will save this persistent level right here. Let's add our first element to this level, and that's going to be a light, a directional light. The reason being that the light will persist, so we can keep it in the main parent. All right, and here we have that light. You can press F to zoom in on any object. Typically, this will be more with a object that has some kind of actual structure to it, like a cube. You can also rotate the light because oftentimes you'll have to rotate the light down if you want it to actually point at something. Otherwise, something could, below it could still stay dark. For example, I could quickly create a sample sphere and you'll notice if the sphere is not underneath the light, then the sphere actually won't be lit up. So it has to be underneath this light and then the light has to be rotated. Here, I can close this output log and zoom in here. All right, just by scrolling. And you can see how here I have to rotate my light around. So press that rotation tool. Then I do have to rotate on these axes, this light, and it changes how the shape is lit. You can also feel free to move the light around or change the type of light if you don't want a directional light. All right, so that's going to affect how your objects are rendered. All right, if you want to see all of your objects inside of this level, then you're going to go into the World Outliner window. So just go to the window and select World Outliner if it's not there already. You can see we have our light and our sphere. So we can delete the sphere. That was just to show you the directional light. Then let's go back to levels. We have our persistent level here, and now let's create our first tile. This will be our first procedural level. Okay, so I'm going to select levels this time and create a new level. So I'm not going to file a new level. That would create a new persistent level. I'm going to go to levels and then create new. Then I'm going to again select an empty level, and I'm going to save this as under my levels folder, this will be my first procedural level. So I can call this procedural level one and hit save. And look at this, we now have a child of our persistent level. I can hide the procedural level, but the persistent level will stay visible unless I click that little eye icon. So this procedural level, this is going to be our first tile. Okay, so let's click on the procedural level and let's add to it an element. I'm going to add to it a tile. So we can just use a cube. We could also use a plane. Let's do a cube. And here I'm going to grab my scale tool beside the rotation tool. And I'm just going to change this cube just by clicking, holding, and scrolling here to create this tile. Okay, you can also go to default view to see that in cinematic viewport or the default viewport cinematic just removes all those rulers mostly. Okay, so here we have our tile, our ground. We can make it even flatter if we like. All right, and we have the light pointing on the tile because if I removed the light from the world outliner, you'll notice here the cube won't be lit up. So that's why we need that light. Okay, let's go back to levels. Now this cube that is only going to be visible in the procedural level. You'll notice it's not visible in the persistent level. Okay, that's because this is going to be one version of the ground. Now mine is orange here because I've actually have my level color here, my material of the cube changed. 
So if you click on this cube and go to the details tab, you can see different properties like transform, static mesh, and materials. So my basic shape material is orange, but you can double click on that if you want to change this. And then all you have to do here is change the color that you have selected. So you could change it from orange to just this default gray, which is pretty typical of objects. Then you just have to save this material and it's going to update all of the basic shape materials. Typically they're not orange, I just changed mine to orange in another project, so that's why it's persisted along to this next project. Okay, now that that has saved, you can close that material and you'll be right back to the cube. And notice here the cube is now gray. And that will be the color for every basic shape you create because every basic shape gets a basic shape material. But you can change the material later on. Okay, so here we have our cube. This represents our first tile. We're going to start off really basic, just creating a bunch of cubes and they will be procedurally generated. So we'll have little cubes on top of this tile or another tile and we'll have just a simple geometric tile and that's going to be our generation for the level. Then later on we're going to add materials and environment models so we'll actually create a procedural environment. But this is going to be our first tile so you can see this is just a tile. It even looks like a tile. But what we're going to do next is we're going to create slightly different tiles and then we'll use these tiles for our pattern. So join me in our next lecture. We're going to build more tiles for the level. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture we built out our first procedural level tile. And in this lecture, we're going to build out more of these tiles. You can create as many as you'd like. All you have to do is make sure you're inside of your persistent level parent. Then you're going to click this levels button and create a new level in order to create a sub level. Here you're going to select empty level and you're going to name this your next procedural level such as procedural level two. You can save these in any folder. It's just for organization purposes. All right, here we have procedural level two. You can hide procedural level one to see what's inside of procedural level two. All there is is the directional light which comes from the persistent level parent. All right, so if you hide the persistent level parent, then you won't see that light. The reason we want the light in the persistent level parent is so that we don't have to recreate that light for every child. Let's hide that first procedural level and we can see that the second procedural level, it's empty. That's because we haven't put anything into it. So let's actually copy the cube from procedural level one and put it into procedural level two and then add some slight modifications. All right, so I am going to just click on the cube and then hit control C to copy it. Okay, let's see, there's also here under edit, you can go to copy as well and see the keyboard shortcut. Then click on procedural level two and you can even hide procedural level one. And if you hit control V, you can paste. So I'm just doing paste with the keyboard shortcut. And don't forget to save often. And here, what I've done is just copied the cube from one level to the other. All right, next, let's differentiate this tile because remember, we want a random level. We don't just want a level of all these exactly the same tiles. Let's give this level some slight difference. All right, so for this, we can add to it another shape. We can give it a different color as well. So let's say we add to it a cylinder. Then I'm going to select the movement tool and just move that cylinder up. Okay, so now this tile has a cylinder. Feel free to copy and paste as many of those as you like. And you don't even have to keep them on the tile. You could drag it away a little bit as well and see the effect that has. Often that can create a more of a natural look. Okay, so here we have our next procedural level. All right, let's create another one. So all we have to do is follow the same process. Just go to levels and then create new. 
select empty level and then give this a new name procedural level three and hit enter if you hide level one and two you'll see procedural level three is empty so you can copy the same tile so that level three has the same basic structure so just take this cube from procedural level two and hit control C then go into procedural level three and hit control V so you have that base tile the same then you can add to this a new object such as a cone all right and if you can't find the cone just go into the world outline the world outliner here you can see and just click on the cone and that will show you where it is in the scene then you can drag it up so it's actually visible okay so here we have three procedural levels feel free to create as many as you'd like these are going to be the tiles that we're going to use in order to create the different parts of our level okay so feel free to resize these objects as well as you see fit all right so I'm going to just resize this cone okay then I'm going to just copy and paste the cone all right so there's cone 2 and I'm going to drag it around a little bit so now I have three distinct tiles okay one tile is completely just an empty tile another tile has cylinders and another tile has cones okay so next up now that we have our tiles created we're going to build a blueprint and the blueprint is going to randomly place these tiles beside each other with a random rotation on the Z axis and as well we're going to randomly place the tiles so that way we'll have a whole bunch of these tiles each of them but they'll all be placed randomly each time all right so that is how we're going to create our procedural level now this we're just doing with primitives just with cones and cylinders and tiles but you could make this a lot more complicated of a scene you can add here some terrain or some floor material some texture you could add trees or buildings or characters each of these tiles can be as detailed as you'd like we're starting off with the primitives and a very basic look to the level just so that you can actually get the functionality down and then we'll add in the materials and the art afterward all right so join me coming up in our next lecture we're going to build our blueprint to randomly place these tiles on the whole new map hello everyone and welcome back to our course in the previous lecture we built out our final tiles for our level all right so now in this lecture we're going to build a blueprint that is going to take these three tiles it's going to loop through them and it's going to place them randomly on our map and then replicate them over and over again and it will rotate them and put them in random positions and that is going to create our procedural level it will generate a random level each time we hit the play button so every time we hit play we are going to have a random level created and that level will be random because it will have this random structure of its tiles there are many ways to build procedurally generated levels this is just the tile based way all right so let's get started the blueprint that we're going to create is actually going to be on the persistent level itself because this is the container for our three children so in this persistent level we have these different icons the lighting scenario level lock the blueprint and save we're interested in the level blueprint so make sure you're in the persistent level here and then click on the icon of the blueprint to open open that level blueprint all right here we have our blueprint details containing our graphs our functions macros variables and event dispatchers you can add new variables functions and more with the add button then you have your event graph itself here you can right click to navigate around and this is the blueprint editor you'll notice here there's an asterisk beside the persistent level name whenever you see an asterisk beside a name it means it's an unsaved 
object. So just save the level with Control S or File Save here, and you can see the keyboard shortcut. Okay, and here we're being prompted to right click to create new nodes. We have two default nodes here. We have the event begin play node, and we have the event tick node. Event begin play is going to begin as soon as the game runs, when I hit the play button here. All right, and let's see, I just lost that. Let me just put this back in. You can also drag your blueprint editor right beside your actual level. All right, let's see. I'm going to make sure we're not running anymore and I'm going to save everything. Okay, great. Here we have then event tick. Event tick is going to run every frame of the game. So you can click on the node and delete it if you don't need it. These are the default ones, but they're not required. You can also click, hold, and drag around the nodes as well. We're interested in event begin play because as soon as I hit this play button, instead of my character just falling blindly through space because my level currently, the persistent level is just this black space. Instead, I want to procedurally generate my level. So that's why I need event begin play. And when you save something, just make sure you're, you've clicked outside of a node, then you can save the level. All right, so first we want to loop through each of the different tiles in our map. The map can be thought of as a grid of all of our tiles. So we're going to grab here an executable and drag away from it. So click, hold, and drag, and then let go to place a new node. Here we can select an executable action, something that we want to happen from this huge list. Okay, I'm going to start by creating a for loop. Okay, and this is going to allow me to loop through some kind of list. For example, I can loop through all of the tiles, all of the tile spots that are available in my map grid. And I'm using a for loop, not a for each loop, because I want the indices to be available to me. Okay, so here I am, I have this for loop created. You'll notice here, this for loop will run as soon as the game begins because the loop is connected to the event begin play node. This event will immediately start as soon as the play begins, as soon as I hit play. All right, so here we have a for loop. We have a starting index and an ending index. Then we have the loop body, what we want to happen inside of the loop at every iteration of the loop. We also have the current index because it's going to loop from the starting to the ending. And we can also do something when the for loop has finished. Okay, first let's specify the starting index and the ending index. And we're going to start at index zero, and then we're going to end at some value that we want to be our number of tiles in our map on one axis. For example, if I wanted a 10 by 10 grid, I would pass in here a 10. So just click once in here and then put in 10. You can also extract these values into variables so that way they're reusable and it's more clear what they represent. So to turn this into a variable, just click on the green button there and just quickly click it and then drag away and then release. Here we're going to select promote to variable. This means we took that number nine and we just promoted it or changed it to a variable. So you'll notice I can't even see the number nine anymore. All right, that's because I made it into this variable and you can see the variable details on the left hand side. Okay, first let's change the variable name to be something a little more descriptive. And let's call this our level grid size and hit enter. As well, you want to scroll down and make sure that your variable has a value. Because even though we promoted it from nine to a variable, that doesn't always preserve its value. So you'll notice before we can see its default value, we have to compile the blueprint. So just hit the compile button in the top left hand corner here and make sure you have a green check mark. If you don't have a green check mark, it means you've done something wrong. So make sure you look at your blueprint very closely. It's very easy to accidentally make a mistake in your blueprint to forget one of these little values, perhaps. 
And here now we can see we have a default value for our level grid size variable, and that's 10. Make sure you have a 10 here, not a zero, because we need to start at index zero and end at index 10 in order to create a 10 by 10 grid. Okay, now we can bring back this event graph. All right, so we've set up our blueprint starting point. We have specified when we're going to begin building our level, and we've started a for loop to go from zero to 10 in order to create our level grid. There's quite a lot more we need for this blueprint. So let's continue on with this in our next lecture. Join me over there where we're going to continue building out this blueprint, which is going to place our tiles randomly on our grid. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we began building out our blueprint. And in this lecture, we are going to continue building out our blueprint here. All right, so for our next step, we're going to build out our grid. Currently, we've looped from zero to 10, and that's going to create our one side of the grid. If we want to create the other side, we have to create a nested for loop. So inside of the loop body of the current for loop, we're going to actually extend that. And we are going to build a second of for loops. Just click, hold, and drag this out, and then release. And we're going to create a new executable action. This will be a for loop again. So select the for loop there. And just like that, we've created a nested for loop because inside of the loop body, we are making another loop. So this time, instead of just going from zero to 10, we're actually going to go from zero to 100 because we're going to go from zero to 10 inside of zero to 10. All right, so here inside of our last index, we also can use this level grid size variable. Now, what do we want to happen at each tile? Because if we have from zero to 10 and then inside of that from zero to 10, it means we're going from zero to 100. So what do we want to happen at each of the 100 tiles? Well, remember each tile is one of those levels, one of the procedural levels. And so we want to generate a random tile. So for this, we have to get the procedural level that we want to generate. And this will be gotten randomly for each of the 100 different tiles. So what we're going to do is right click here inside of the event graph. And we are going to search here for get streaming level. Hit enter here. And this will return a level streaming object with a specified level package name. All right. And from here, the return value is going to be our levels. Let's just drag around here. And let's drag out this return value. And we are going to perform an action taking a level streaming object reference. That action is going to be to create an instance and hit enter. So here we're going to create an instance of this level and we'll get this level randomly. All right, so here, this is going to create the instance of one tile and we want to ha this to happen a hundred times. So we're going to grab this loop body and pass it to the create instance. So this means that because we're inside of the nested for loop, it means that inside of the loop body, a hundred times we're going to call this function create instance. And note that we had to first create get streaming level. We couldn't just run off the loop body and then search here create instance, oh, create instance because you actually won't even get that option here. You'll have create action instance, create lightweight instance, create dynamic material instance, but you won't actually get this create instance of a level streaming object. You have to first create this function. So you have to do it a bit backwards here. All right, so that is going to create an instance of the level. And we'll specify later how to randomly get the level that we want to use. Because remember, we do have several options of those tiles. Okay. and. Then afterwards, we can specify what we want to happen with this level. So let's drag this out just by right clicking, holding and dragging. And we can specify what we want to happen here after we have created an instance of that level. 
Okay, I'm going to call here a setter because I want to set my level transform. So here I'm going to set level transform. This comes from level streaming. So I can double click on that. This will set the value of the variable level transform applied to actors. The reason I want to do this is because I want to set a random position and a random rotation for each of the levels. So I'm going to transform each level. Okay, and later we can specify, we can pass in the parameters. As well, I want to make sure that each of the levels is loaded and visible. Okay, so for this, I'm going to pass here a new node and I'm going to call set again. This time set should be loaded and should be visible. So let's start with set should be loaded. Again, this comes from level streaming. This means that we should load the level. Make sure to also check this box here, this checkbox to ensure that this is passed as true. The level should be loaded. All right, and the target here, that is the level that we're actually loading. So what is the target? The target actually comes from this create instance. So this create instance, it creates a level streaming object, which is returned and we can pass it to this setter. So that way we are going to set the transform of each level that's created. And we're also going to pass it into the setter here of should be loaded. It's also the target there. We have to set it won't get passed automatically via the executable node. It has to be passed via this blue node, the target node. All right, and one more thing that we're going to add here is I'm also going to ensure that it should be visible. So I'm just going to create another node and I'm going to search here should, and this time I'm going to select should be visible. So that second one and hit enter. And again, check that box to make sure that should be visible is true. So this means that the level should be visible. So first the level will be loaded. We've ensured that it will be loaded. Now we're ensuring that it will be visible. And again, we have to pass the target. So let's just drag this over and let's pass in the target level. Remember that's what we're actually manipulating. And that is that same level that was spawned. And we're going to do that for each of the 100 levels or tiles. All right, don't forget to save your blueprint and also compile it often just to make sure you don't have any blueprint problems. All right, there we go. So now we have so far created our loop going from zero to 100 and we have gotten the level we've created an instance for each of those 100 tiles. And we've specified that each one will be transformed, loaded and visible. Okay, next step, we still have more to do for this blueprint. For example, we have to actually pass in how we're going to get the level here, we have to pass in the package name. And for this, we're going to get a random level each time a random tile. And as well, we need to also pass in the transform that we want to do. So we want to set the level transform. The level transform means where is that tile placed and also how is it rotated and how is it scaled? All right, so join me coming up in our next lecture, we are going to work on those next two steps of the blueprint. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we learned how to create a new instance of a tile. In this lecture, we're continuing our blueprint for the persistent level. And we're going to learn how we can specify a random streaming level or tile or procedural level for each of the 100 tiles in our 10 by 10 grid. So to get a random tile each time, and we are going to pass in here a package name. So just drag this package name off to create a new node. And I'm going to create a getter. Okay, and here we are going to get an array. And we can select here a reference to an array. Okay, so we're going to pass in an array or a list that contains all of the names of the available tiles, which are the tiles we created. And then we're just going to choose a random, random element from that array. So here we have a getter. So we have to go backwards like this 
to create this array of names. We're going backwards here because the type of the array is not just an integer or a float, but it's actually of a package name. Okay, so then I'm going to drag off this node here and I'm going to create a new array. And here we can promote this to a variable and we now have this new var zero, an array of names. And I'm going to drag back in my details window here so I can see this variable. First, let's give it a more detailed name. You don't want to leave the names here, the default, because otherwise things will get very confusing and you'll forget what variables mean very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to call this instead streaming level names. Okay, this is an array of names. That's why the type here is name. All right, and we can also give a default value. First, we have to compile our blueprint. Okay, so we can see here we're prompted to give the variable a default value. Currently, there are zero array elements, but if you hit the plus button here, you can add an element to the array. Index counting begins at zero. Here, we're going to pass in the name of that first persistent level that we made, which we called, or procedural level, which we called procedural level one. And you have to make sure that it does indeed match up with the name that you had for your procedural level. So you can just go back to your content browser and you can make sure that you're calling it by that appropriate name. Here we have procedural level one, procedural level two, and procedural level three. These are the exact names we want to use for our array here because we're actually going to use the names to search and find that tile. And we want to create this for all of our available tiles. So if you've created more than three tiles, make sure you create here a new element inside of the array for each of the tiles you created. Okay, there we go. So now we have our streaming level names variable with three array elements. Okay, which means we can now hide that tab again. All right, so here we are going to get always index zero because currently that's what is passed in here is zero. So we're going to go into the array and always choose index zero and pass it to the streaming level for each of the hundred streaming levels that will be created or tiles. Instead of always choosing tile zero, we want to choose a random tile from our three options. We want to choose a random tile each of the hundred instances. Okay, so how do we choose a random tile? Well, instead of passing in zero here, we're going to pass in a random integer. So first I'm going to create a node that goes off of streaming level names. And here I'm going to get the length of the array. This just returns the number of elements in that array. So let me just do that again. Length here, hit enter, there we go. This returns for me three because I have three tiles. All right, and then I can get a random integer here inside of my length. So I can choose a random integer. To do that, I'll just use the return value, which is the length of the array, which is three. And I'm going to here perform a function, random integer. This will choose a random whole number between zero and the max minus one. Note that this means the maximum is actually exclusive. So we're going to choose a random number from zero to two because the length is three, which is the max. And this function returns a random number from zero to the max minus one. We want zero to two because if you go into your details view and you click on your variable, then the default value, you'll see that the indices are actually zero, one, and two not one, two, three, because index counting begins at zero. So this fits perfectly here. We're getting the length three, then we're choosing a random integer from zero to the max exclusive. This is going to return for us a random value each time. It's going to return for us either zero, one, or two randomly each time the function is called. And we're going to take that return value and pass it to the getter. So this time, instead of always getting zero as our streaming level name index in that array, 
instead of always choosing tile zero, we're actually going to randomly choose between tiles zero, one, and two. And then that is going to be the random tile that's created each time. Okay, awesome. So that is how you can choose a random streaming level to be created each time. Next up for this blueprint, what we have to do is set the transform of each of the levels of each of those tiles. So let me just drag this over. There we go. And we can see here in our setter for each instance of a tile, we have level transform that has not been filled in yet. So we want to fill in this level transform next. This is going to allow us to set a random location and a random rotation and a random scale for our tiles for each of the hundred tiles that are created. All right, so coming up next, we are going to fill in this final part of this blueprint. Join me in our next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we learned how to select a random level each time we want to create a new tile. In this lecture, we are going to now transform each level. We're going to set its position and its rotation. And you could also set its scale as well. So here you'll notice we have an unfilled level transform property. We're going to drag off this node and place a new action that provides a transform. And that is make transform. So select here, make transform. And you'll see here you can create location, rotation and scale. Let's start with the location. Okay. How do we select where each tile should be placed? Because we don't want them all to be placed by default at 0, 0, 0. All right, so for this, we're going to have to be able to take in the total grid size as well as the size of each tile. And then we're going to need to choose the midpoint so they're all spawned from the center. All right, so let's go up here we're going to go into our level grid size and we're going to put this into use to get started i am going to create a new variable so i'm going to open up my details view of the blueprint and then i'm going to add a new variable here the name is going to be the tile size and the type will be float all right here so then we can go back to the blueprint and we'll see the tile size right there also, I want to change its default value. I'm going to set this to 1000. Alright, so here now we are going to have our level grid size, which we can click on and we can open We can see that is 10. Alright, and then the total tile size is 1000. Now we're going to take those two values together. So I'm just going to drop my tile size onto my grid and use a getter. So I'm just using this variable. Then I'm going to multiply the tile size by the level grid size. So I'm going to here search for float and I want to do multiplication. So let's see, I'll do multiply, there we go. And I want to pass in my tile size here to the multiplication. All right, so I'm multiplying this integer by the float. Okay, and next up, I need to continue in order to actually get the center of my grid because that's where I want to start the spawning. All right, so for this, I'm going to then perform a division. Okay, so I'm going to go off of here and add a new action taking in a float and that is to divide. All right, so here I can choose division. All right, and let's bring that bit down. All right, so we've taken the level grid size and multiplied it by tile size. Next, we want to divide it. All right, in order to divide it, we first need to get the current index that we're at. All right, so I'm going to get the index on the X axis and the Y axis. So I'm going to drop my tile size again, or I could just put it to use right here from there. It doesn't really matter. You could just use the version that you have here. And I'm going to drag here off of this a new node and this will be multiply. All right, I need to multiply this tile size by one of the indices from the for loop. So here we can have we can see our for loop. We have two of them. The first one is for 
our first axis and the second one is for another axis, such as for x and then for y. Because each of the tiles is going to be placed along the x-axis and along the y-axis in a grid. So I'm going to drag the index and use that for each of the tiles. That way they'll all be placed according to what index they are. All right, and I'm going to need that for both of the axes, but let's just start with one, such as the x-axis. So I'm taking the index and multiplying it by the tile size. And then off of here, off of this multiplication, I am then going to pass in subtraction. Okay, so I'll take here, subtract. And I'm going to subtract the value that we had here of division. So I'm going to pass that to the subtraction. And then afterwards, I'm going to take the returned value and pass it to the location. Now I want to pass it just to the location on the x. So here for this location vector, we are going to right click on it and we're going to split the struct pin. So we split these three that are just as one pin into three pins because we want the X location to be separate from the Y location. Because just because a tile has the X value of, for example, 100, it might be at value 500 on the Y axis. All right, so here we go. We have to do the exact same now for location Y. So I'm going to create multiplication again. All right, here, so let's drag off a node and we're going to multiply. This time though, the index that we're passing in for multiplication is not going to be the same for loop. It's actually going to be the nested for loop because remember one of these is just from zero to 10 on one axis. The other one is zero to 10 on the other axis. That's what creates that multiplication table of sorts. That's what creates the grid. So I'm going to use the other index from our other for loop and drag it down. So let's just drag that down to the multiplication. Okay, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit here. And here we go. Now we have our multiplication for the y axis. Again, we are going to subtract that. So let's create another node, another action, and it's going to be subtract. What are we subtracting? We're subtracting that same value from division. Okay, and we're passing the return value to location y. We can compile this and everything is good to go. All right, one more thing we can change is the rotation. If you rotate on the X or Y, you're actually going to be creating more of a three-dimensional grid, which you might want. If you rotate on the Z, then you're just rotating along just the flat ground. So you're just rotating the level around. In fact, you could look at that just by going into one of your levels and making it visible, and then just rotating around the cube, if you have that cube visible. Okay, but for us, let's just go back into the blueprint here and I want to just use a random number to rotate randomly around the z-axis. So again I'm going to right click on the pin and I'm going to split the struct pin into three because the x and y they can stay at zero. I don't want to rotate in the rolling or pitching. I just want to rotate on the yaw. So I'm going to have a flat grid but each of the flat tiles will just be rotated around. Okay, so how do I select a random rotation? For this, I'm going to choose a random integer. All right, so let's just right click here and anywhere in the blueprint and select a random integer function with just searching random integer. We can select a max integer, otherwise we'll always be selecting zero. Okay, so let's select a maximum integer such as three here. All right. And then the return is going to be a random number between zero and the max minus one. And I'm going to take this return value and I'm going to multiply it. Okay. And multiply it by my random rotation on the Z. Okay. So here we have rotation Z and I'll just drag that right here and pass it in. Okay, so there we go. We are always going to be multiplying this by 90 as well, because that way we'll go from zero to 90 to 180 to 270. 
and that will be the random rotation selected each time. Make sure you have this 90 here because this is multiplication. We want to multiply the random integer by 90. Otherwise, if this is 0, your rotation will always be multiplied by 0, so your rotation will always be 0. So this 90 is important there. Okay, and that is how we can randomly transform each of the tiles in terms of setting their location and also their rotation. Feel free to experiment with rotating on the X and Z. You'll just see that you will create more of a three-dimensional grid where your grids can actually just stand up, whereas just rotating on the Z rotates them but keeps them flat on the ground. One more thing we have to select is this unique instance name. So when you make a blueprint, you want to check to see which values or pins you left unfilled. For example, we've left unfilled so far this unique instance name. So join me coming up in our next lecture. We are going to learn how we can choose a random instance name. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're going to learn how we can grab a unique instance name string for each tile that's created. All right, and then we can test out our blueprint. So here for this unique instance name, we want to take the index on the x-axis and on the y-axis. So in the first for loop and the second for loop, and we want to put those to use in order to create our instance name for each tile. All right, so I'm going to grab the index of the first for loop, and then I'm going to append here. So I'm going to first have to convert it to a float. So let's, or not to a float, but rather to a string here. All right, so let's convert this to a string. We're just casting the integer from a string because that is the unique instance name data type. It's a string. Strings are also pink here. Okay, we want to convert it to a string and then we can append onto the string. All right, so I'm going to append here. First, I'm going to append an X or a multiplying. So you could use an asterisk or an X here. And then let's add a pin to add another value to append. And I'm going to append my second index here. And it's just going to be automatically converted to a float or to a string. Okay, so here we're taking the first index, adding an X and then adding the second index. So in this way, we're going to get for each tile where it is in terms of the index on the X and on the Y. Okay, and we can take the returned string and that will be our unique instance name. So if we need to grab each tile by a string, we can grab it. All right, now let's go ahead and compile our code here and let's save our blueprint. And before we test this out, make sure that you have a few things set up correctly. For example, your cube, which is the tile size, has to be 10 by 10, because that is what we specified as our level grid size. So this has to be an equal match of 10 by 10. Otherwise, you'll have gaps in your grid. Okay, so this has to be 10 by 10, because that's what we specified in the blueprint. And also, make sure that the position of the grid each tile is 0, 0, 0, and you may have to adjust all of its objects accordingly. So you have to have the starting location be 0, 0, 0 for each of the grids, this each of the tiles. All right, so now we have our blueprint and our levels set up. Note that whenever you make a change to a level, like let's say I wanted to move one of these cylinders. I have to actually make sure I press this save level icon on that level that I just changed. And you have to be careful that you actually changed the proper level and you save that proper level. So it helps to hide it if you're not actually changing it. Otherwise you'll be confused what level you're changing. So if I make any change to this level, I have to hit that save level icon. The changes won't be updated automatically. So take note of that. Now we can hit play and I zoomed in all of my text sizes, so your play will be in the center here, but here you can either press play or you'll have an option right beside that. It can be either three ellipses or if you've adjusted your font size as well, it'll just be the play underneath. And this is just expanded play. So you can select here 
selected viewport if you want to play as a character, mobile preview to test on a mobile phone, new editor window to play in a new window, a standalone game to build the game in its own process, or simulate, which means you can't actually use your character, but you will see the game. So it's easiest to start off at simulate and then hit play. And if I zoom out here, look at this, we can see we have our level generated. This is a completely random procedurally generated level. If I hit stop and then I press play again, the level will be regenerated and now it is completely different. Okay, so every time I hit stop and then I hit play, the level is drawn differently. All right, so there we go. That is how we can generate a level procedurally. And you'll notice I don't have any gaps between my tiles because I made sure to make the tiles square and to put them at the position zero, zero. All right, so there we go. That is how you can procedurally generate a level. Okay, now we've done this just with primitives to make sure that we were able to get all the functionality down. So next up, we can actually start adding more art and color and material to this version. So join me in our next section. We're going to learn how we can build a more realistic looking level. Because if you're building out a data set for machine learning, you typically want a realistic landscape or a realistic 3D model, perhaps that you're looking at from different angles. Perhaps you want to put a model of some object that you want to be able to recognize, like a thing or a person, and then you want to rotate around them or rotate them to get them from all angles. So that way the machine learning model can recognize an object at all angles. Well, if you want to do that, whether it's for a thing or a landscape, if you want your model to learn how to recognize a tree or grass, or just basically any kind of image segmentation where you want to be able to find the edges in an image to be able to detect what could possibly be in that image, you want to have a realistic image or a realistic environment that you are using to build your data set. So although we have this basic level out, we can make it more realistic. Okay, so typically you want to create as realistic of a possible as level, real, realistic level as possible, because that way you're mimicking the real world. So instead of having to go out into the real world and take a bunch of sample images you can instead really quickly and automatically generate the landscape and generate the images with a blueprint. And that could just take all the images for you at all angles, at all locations. So you want to be able to make the real world as realistically as possible. So next up, we're going to make our level more realistic just by adding some assets and materials to our tiles. So instead of just having these primitives like cones and cylinders, we're going to make a more realistic level. So join me in our next section. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.